Welcome back to the Crash Moto GP podcast. An absolute pleasure to have your company. As always, my name is Harry Benjamin, joined by former British champion and BT Sport commentator Keith Hewitt and Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren. On the show this week, more calendar rumours, rider rumours, because it is, well, the summer break, so rumours are the main talking point. And in light of Formula One's recent experiment with a format change, adding in what is essentially a sprint qualifying race, should Moto GP change up their format too all that plus your questions answered as ever Keith Pete welcome as always always a pleasure to have you alongside and we're going to start as well with a few calendar updates because we have obviously the big news last week which was Australia uh, going down the pan yet again and uh, the latest news coming out in terms of the MotoGP calendar is that the uh, Mandalinka circuit is 80% complete in uh, Indonesia it's set to host uh, the World Superbikes this year and MotoGP in 2022 so homologation they're saying is expected by the end of the month however thailand is considering postponing their 2021 moto gp event which is then casting doubt on the neighboring uh, circuits around there so what are you hearing from your ends keith and pete oh, it's exciting in one terms that we're getting this sort of new circuit but also we're still so unsure about how long this calendar is going to be i know we've spoken about it already but it just doesn't seem like it's doable at the moment I'll tell you what, if you were a circuit builder at the moment, investing all the amount of money, you would be whinging about where you are in the, the great wide scheme of things, wouldn't you? Because what a time to invest in something like that. You just hope that they've got the funding to carry it through. How many times have we seen this kind of, I'll call it the circuit of Wales syndrome. Uh, they're far, far further down the road than that, of course. But it's still about funding. It's still about putting that to, to the test. And it's not going to happen anytime soon the thailand thing i mean it's quite interesting i was reading on crash.net um earlier today pete's pete on that and peter's well connected in thailand as am i as well through family obviously and and we understand what's going on in thailand but then i spoke to a very high up person uh, just yesterday afternoon regarding the thai round particularly and they have all the protocols in place they have agreement with the region as how they're going to ship people on charter flights in hotel bubbles in flight bubbles in and out of thailand for that job and across of course to kuala lumpur straight after that because it's back to back with sepang if we lose thailand we're probably going to lose sepang unless it goes a double header there but really and truly nobody really knows i would suspect that what's happened is they've got agreement for their protocols they've got agreement on how they're going to run the event if it goes ahead but if the massive increase in uh, in the pandemic in thailand continues at the rate it's going out at the moment i certainly can't see it my family can't see it and like i say we're we're 50 50 based here and there mm. um pete you you're right on top of it and you know how tough it is just to live there at the moment as you say keith the, the added dimension with these overseas races is this big question mark over having fans isn't it i mean we've seen that that Dorna and MotoGP, they can cope with closed door races in Europe, no problem. Even if it's just a handful of fans, let's say, effectively, the races can go ahead. But we've always been told that these overseas races, because of all the added costs involved, that they need spectators. And you know, you're in a situation where Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, there's a lot of restrictions on any kind of gatherings. You can barely have a restaurant open in some places. So let alone having significant numbers of fans, that seems to be the the big issue that needs to be overcome. How would they fill that, that financial black hole of, of the ticket sales that, that presumably won't be able to go ahead at the moment unless things change dramatically in the next three months? I wonder how deep Dorna's pockets are. I mean, they've bailed out quite a lot this last year or so. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's hard work at trackside. I mean, I've been told by numerous people that it's worse this year than it was in 2020 they are having a much harder time this year than they did in 2020 um and with the increase i mean <laughs> i mean look at us <laughs> freedom day monday <laughs> i mean it, it's almost laughable isn't it i mean things are going from bad to worse in the way of infections and yet we are on freedom day i mean they opened all the nightclubs here on uh, one minute past 12 o'clock and you're thinking to yourself it, it, it's almost like lemmings jumping over the cliff it feels like to me, you know, everybody, of course, we all want it. Everybody wants it. We're all going stir crazy. But, you know, my youngest daughter's school has shut down completely. Like two or three years are, are rife with COVID. Positive wow. tests. Teachers have got it. Positive tests. I mean, and we're all going to be running around with no masks on for the next 
until we get to the third, fourth, fifth rock wave or whatever it is. It ain't going away, and there's a good argument for saying we've got to put up with it and get used to it, but there are actually people still dying from it. I don't know why I say that with a smile on my face, because it really, really ain't funny. I mean, if you've got vulnerable people around you, I mean, I've got a very elderly mum who has to have carers every day. I'm around there every day. My wife's around there every day. The chances of her, even though she's double jabbed, chances of her getting it is quite high. And when you run into a country like Thailand, where their vaccination program is so far behind the game, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. Thailand is notorious for not, should we say, pushing forward some of the things that they probably should do. Um, a lot depends on uh, uh, money and government quite often, but they do seem to be a long, long way behind considering their aspirations. I saw uh, an advert the other day, I think it was on Eurosport, for the jet ski championships that, that the finale is, is in quite often have it in Pattaya in uh, down in Chambury down the, the, the on the Gulf Coast and it, it, you know that is going to bring in lots of people as well it's a question of risk and reward don't quite know where to go with this Peter I've got to say I'm rambling as I do but Thailand is one of those situations that I can't personally see it happening but I'm told all the protocols are in place. They've got agreement with the government and the region for going to Thailand with the three and a half thousand people or whatever it is now for, for, for the classes. And then they will go again as in their bubble across to Malaysia for the Sepang International Race as well. So it's in place, but it's going to be a case, I think, on the increase in infections in the country and whether Dorna are prepared to pay Chang International Circuit, the promoters and, and so on and so forth, the money that they need to run the event without spectators, because I can't see that happening. I can't see spectators there. I, th I think it's also interesting the scenario or the order of things that we've seen with event cancellations. We've, we've seen that usually Dorna and MotoGP, they're ready to go anywhere. As you say, they plan for every eventuality. It's usually the cancellation comes from the circuit side, doesn't it? Where, it, you know, Dorna leave it in the hands of the tracks or the organisers in, in each country. It's not Dorna that usually cancel races. It's the races that say, sorry, we can't have MotoGP. So, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that Dorna is absolutely 100% ready to go. Um, I think from their side, they, they are ready to have a race. They can put a race on, but they need to hear from, from the Thai side, from the Malaysian side, you know, all of the, you know, each individual country, do you, do you want to go ahead with the race? And we normally hear that the timeline is about three months. That's usually what, what you know, when Donna needs to know, are you going to have a race or not? So it's just interesting that this mid-July, where we are now, the race is scheduled exactly for mid-October, and suddenly there's these reports in the Thai media of the some of the government ministers to do with tourism saying that they, you know, not that it, not that they're absolutely 100% cancelled, but they're considering it given the situation. So it just fits in with that timeline, but I've no doubt that MotoGP would be ready to go to Malaysia or Thailand, you know, almost at a drop of a hat now. I think they've got everything ready. We saw for the Sepang test, yes, it didn't go ahead, but they also had a really good bubble system ready, you know, stay at the, near the, near the uh, airport, the track's right there. They would, they would just go directly from the, the track to the hotels, no, you know, no visiting anywhere else. They were ready to go. But then, again, the, the, the circuit or the Malaysian government decided it was too risky and they pulled the test. So I think, I think the ball is in the court of the, each individual circuit or the government, the people that are funding the race, to really tell MotoGP what they want to do. The other aspect, I suppose, sorry for jumping in again, Harry, but I think the other, the other aspect that we've got to consider as well with some of these... Um, Southeast Asian tracks, hospitality is a major thing. Being seen at an event like that is a major thing. The, the money comes to the track side. They want to be seen. A bit, bit like the F1, you know, Cruise and Co. that were all there being seen on the, you know, you get the same Thai version of that. It's a big deal in Thailand being seen at the right event. And no guest passes are being issued by anybody. You cannot get a guest pass. I mean, it's, it's something, I, I spoke to Mike Trimby at, at Erta the other day, the, the source of many a guest pass for me and my, uh, my guests. Um, and they are not being issued. I mean, Silverstone, forget it. You're not going to get a guest pass. There's nobody going to be, be, be behind that fence that's not supposed to be behind that fence. And I can see that having some impact as well. You know, government officials that want to bring along all their people, if you like, and, and be seen at such an event. Um, they won't be issued uh, for behind the uh, paddock fencing, behind the paddock area. So that may have an, a bearing on it as well. There are so many things that need to fall into place, aren't there? Um, Martin McMartin, and I have not made that name up, that is his name apparently, um, has asked, you know, on 
your own personal belief, do you think the season would be shortened or would you prefer to see more double up rounds in Europe? I think the great thing about double up rounds and they never quite turn out like you would imagine. You won't get the same if you won't get the same result two times over because the weather will be slightly different, the track will be slightly different, the, the data will have been, you know, looked at and sorted and, and changed. Um, so I think that the, a double header at the same track, I naturally wouldn't be that keen on naturally but the fact is is that we do get two distinct races as opposed to the sort of exactly the same result weekend after weekend so double headers probably not the best idea in the world but certainly the best idea in the circumstances perhaps yeah exactly i think that they will try to keep the numbers up so they they won't just shorten the season i think they as keith says they'll do back-to-back races or like we saw with portimao they could bring in a racetrack from earlier earlier in the season again you know, maybe go back to Jerez, Catalonia, you know, th- there's lots of options. So I think we will see a, a full season in terms of numbers, but whether the overseas events will happen, it's, it's wait and see, I think. As long as we don't get two at Valencia. <laughs> Not a fan then. <laughs> no. Well, uh, we'll have to, uh, well, again, it's all about waiting and seeing, is it? You just have to wait, don't you? Um, all right, well, that's... Uh, some of the calendar talk growing which is nice to see you know more circuits on the horizon but still so unpredictable let's uh, go into more unpredictable territory shall we uh, and Patronus Yamaha their 2022 lineup won't be announced until after Austria I'm imagining at the very earliest um Razlan Razali the team principal of Patronus SRT confirming that that will not happen uh, until after both races in August uh and there's still plenty of time there isn't there in this MotoGP season if we have a look first at uh their performance of the, the two riders, first of all. Petronas Yamaha haven't quite hit the heights of last season yet, where Morbidelli finished up vice champion, of course. Even Morbidelli being very vocal this season about being on that two-year-old M1 spec machine and now a leg injury picked up at Le Mans. Looks like it's going to keep him out of racing until Misano. Meanwhile, on the other side of the garage, I mean, we've talked about it loads, Valentino Rossi has only had one top 10 finish through the first nine races are we going to see a whole new lineup next year? Morbidelli could be on his way to the factory seat and Valentino Rossi potentially to retirement. Interesting, though, they're saying they're waiting completely on what Valentino Rossi's going to do. Well, you would, wouldn't you? The icon at the end of the day. I suppose you would wait for him. But, I mean, I'm not even looking forward to next year. I'm looking forward to the next round because Cal Crutchlow back. I mean, that's the big deal for me. I mean, Cal Crutchlow, I, I, I feel quite sympathetic towards Cal to be honest with you he's done no testing Yamaha have done what they did with Lorenzo basically they've not he's not been out on the bike he's hardly done any work at all to be chucked in the deep end at at, uh, the Red Bull ring I just think you know he's not race fit you know he'll be mega fit but not race fit because he's not done anything particularly back to back I suppose will be fine he'll have a, a, a second bite of the cherry the week after but it's a it's a it's a tall order for Cal to come in and perform, and he personally will want to perform. I'll, I'll bet you, in his heart of hearts, he'd rather not race in the situation that he's in at the moment because racers want to want perfection. They want it to be the best it can be. They want their best performance. And Cal, if he manages to perform uh, well in the Red Bull ring, you know, at the drop of a hat, I'll be a amazed and b unbelievably pleased um just a shame that he's not full-time really and it's a shame that Yamaha haven't really given him an opportunity to to run the bike a bit more often yeah well of course Pete you know it would be a very popular entry wouldn't it especially with Silverstone not too far away either British rider back on the grid but do you think it it's most likely we will see him back I think he's the, he's the best person available for the job. So, yeah, if you're a betting man, you, you know. No, he is. He is definitely. Yeah, there we are. I think the question is how many races that does he does he do? We know that, that Morbidelli is out until Mizano. So will they keep Crutchlow on for all four rounds? You know, who knows? That would be great. That would include Silverstone. That would be a big boost. I think the issue with, with Cal as to why he might want to, you know, to do this is that he's got a bit of a hole in his testing schedule. Now, you know, there's a state of emergency in Japan or in certain parts of Japan, I think, at the moment. And I think that's interrupted what should have been sort of a steady stream of tests. And so, and then on top of that, he's lost his crew chief. You know, the test team crew chief is now Maverick Villanes' crew chief. 
So, you know, Cal would have been off the bike for a very long time otherwise if he doesn't do these races. So I think, um, you know, it, it makes sense to keep him on the bike. As Keith says, you know, you need to be riding the bike. We saw with Lorenzo last year, he rode at the start of the year and then he tried to ride again at the end of the year and it was just too long off the bike. So if nothing else, Cal will be able to, get, you know, get time on a MotoGP bike for Patronus. He can give them some points. You were just saying, you know, what a disastrous year they've had so far, you know some teams points. I mean, they're, they're, what, ninth in the teams championship. They were second last year. You know, they need any points they can get. It's all very well as saying, oh, put on some other, you know, young guys just to see who, who might do something special on the bike. But, but this year is only halfway through. You know, I think they, they, they badly want to do what they can for this year, resurrect what they can from this season with all the difficulties that they've had. So I think Cal is the best guy to give them a good result. I think that, it will, you know, he'll be on track. He'll be able to, it'll help with his test riding. He can see what the other riders are doing. Maybe he's a very analytical guy, as Keith says, you know, he can spot what other riders on other bikes, how they're getting their speed. You know, he's always been very good at that. Um, and I think he'll also it'll improve his understanding of the bike when, when Quattraro says something, you know, the bike's doing something. And he'll understand a bit more what, what he means by that so that when the testing starts again for him, which I think is maybe not until mid-October, he'll be able to work on things that he, he can better understand the rider's need at the track. So I think, I think it, as Keith said, it's a very difficult situation as far as results. It's a two-year-old bike, which also means there's not many new parts you can put on it that will actually apply. So it's not going to be that he's going to be testing for 2022 or anything. He's just going to be you know, keeping active, doing what he can with the test riding role. But it'll be great to see him with Ramon Focada. I mean, there's two, you know, Cal, super experienced, and loads of knowledge of the Honda. Focada, super experienced, loads of knowledge of the Yamaha. You know, those two guys, similar characters. Um, I think that'll be interesting as well. And, and, you know, for Patronus having a big name as well in the team, alongside Rossi. He wasn't bad on a Yamaha in the old days. I would think that he's kind of, apart from the perfection bit, he's going to be looking forward to it. But um, and he gets to get out of jail free card, really, doesn't he? Not that he'll want one, but um, you know the fact is that he'll be riding that older bike. It'll be without much mileage under his belt. Um, but it's in his contract at the end of the day, so you know he's 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 obliged to to get on with it. And after all, Cal does like money. <laughs> Well, of course, it was uh, Garrett Gerloff who uh, replaced uh, Morbidelli at Aston, but he's been ruled out due to a clash with World Superbikes. But even if Carl Crutchlow isn't particularly you know, keen on doing it, it would serve as good preparation for a wildcard entry at the British Grand Prix. And we spoke about wildcards last week with Danny Pedrosa potentially being lined up in the KTM. So could this be, if anything, just a good bit of prep preparation for a, for a Silverstone entry? I think the fact we're talking about it is a good thing, Harry, because having just seen the Formula One guys, I mean, how beautiful did Silverstone look? Oh. Sunshine and fans at trackside. <laughs> oh, there we go, the tester. All the hairs have just gone up on my arms as I talked about it. That's always, <laughs> it's always a thing, isn't it? You suddenly, I can feel that everything's standing to attention when it came to Silverstone. It was wonderful to see F1 in such good order, you know, proper people down on the grid, you know, racing, of course, you know, it's, it's, depends on your cup of tea, really, isn't it? I mean, we see a bit more action in MotoGP, but I'm not going to be hard on, on Formula 1. It was good to see Formula 1, good to see Silverstone in such good order and looking forward to what it will be like with MotoGP. And, and the very talk of the like of Cal Crutchlow possibly being a wild card on a factory Yamaha at the British Grand Prix when we've all been waiting for such a long time to get back to trackside for the British Grand Prix, it is going to be rammed. Get it sorted now. But of course, things like Day of Champions that we used to have on the Thursday for Two Wheels for Life, which, by the way, look them up, Two Wheels for Life. They very much appreciate your uh, help and uh, subscriptions. Um, Two Wheels for Life, who do a fantastic job, their funding, and it'll be the same across all charities, of course, at the moment, are really, really struggling because some of their main income events are not being supported this year. And again, Thursday prior to Silverstone, you know, I think that we can't have that event, I don't think, this year, unless there's a rapid change as we roll towards the event itself. But um, So it's, it's going to be one of them ones where I think it's going to be absolutely rammed. It's probably going to be the biggest crowd, the biggest audience that we've had for years at Silverstone. I've just got a feeling that we've got this pent-up enthusiasm for everything. And really, Formula One, all that did was whet our appetite. Yeah. Um, we'll see what our crowd figures are like when we get to it. 
I think everyone is uh, super excited for that. Well, British rider back on the grid, maybe the most successful since Barry Sheen. Watch this space. Um, talking of riders, though, and one that's keeping very tight lipped and has been ever since he dropped that bombshell that he is leaving Yamaha, Maverick Vinales. He's been uh, training uh, recently at a, at a training camp out in the somewhere sunny. Um, apparently, all the, all the usual stuff that we've spoken about, Ducati, Aprilia, have all been snooping around in 